Okay. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> Hold on to your hats tonight. Because you're going to laugh your way into heaven with this movie. The world will end in laughter. <laughs> the world will end in laughter. Right, like the roller coaster ride. Hands up for this one. Yeah. Well, this one is is a movie called Holy Man. And basically, this is a very this is a very helpful movie in the sense that we have a situation with the main characters where uh, the main character has, he works in a very high stress competitive job, which a lot of us have faced, and he's got feelings of unworthiness and what he's trying to do is he's trying to overcome those feelings of of sadness and loneliness and unworthiness with the world's formula for solving those problems, which is success. So he wants, he, he has the story of his father and, and it's been a difficult issue to face with his father and what happened to his father and therefore he's, he's trying to succeed and he's got pressure to succeed. And basically he's looking for the solution to unworthiness in the wrong place. Because when we look for something in the world to take us out of our misery and take us out of our unworthiness, all we do is we get another idol that is just a temporary fix and then that crashes. And then if we go for another idol then that crashes and it could get pretty depressing. So he's going to try to use his affirmations, he's trying to pull himself out of it, and um, he's, he's pretty uh, stressed and he's pretty anxious and he's, he's a bit pessimistic and, uh, and his boss is, is very competitive and his boss is one of these like, they call him type A, like slave driving, like trying to drive him and and his desire for success. It's, it's quite an intense, stressful situation. So this is a, a common experience in terms of what happens with the ego in this world. And, and yet, out of all that, uh, we're going to see how Jesus and the Holy Spirit bring in the perfect antidote, the perfect way for him to release all of that and to come back to what he truly wants in his heart. And actually this is a love story, it's an amazing love story. Uh, it may take a while before as you watch this where you start to say, who, who is falling in love here? You know, because it's not so, so obvious but then as it goes along, it's a really a spectacular love story and it's also a spectacular use of symbols because the whole holy man is basically going to come in and be the symbol that turns things all around. And we all have had people in our lives that are that way, that just symbolize the spirit and they, they remind us of the laughter, they remind us of the joy, they remind us of the glee, they remind us of the childlike sense of wonder. And it taps into something that's deep inside of us that goes, yes, that's it. And then we have to turn, we have to make a strong turn in that direction. Because we can't really do this in a partial way, we really have to make the full turn. So in this movie our, our main character is going to be called to make a turn and there will be many, many temptations to go back, to still go back, go back to the old way, go back. And he's going to have to choose and choose and choose again before he lets his heart crack open. This one goes all the way to the burst. This one's, that's the kind of inspirational we, movie we need. We need a, a love story that delivers. We need a love story that's inspired by divinity. A love story that turns things around from the wrong direction to right-mindedness. And 
And to be able to laugh along the way, you know, I remember so many of the movies that I watched in my life uh, were movies like this where I would just get a strong prompt to go rent the, the movie from the video store and whatever I was going through, I was just popped, popped through. Uh, this movie is part of our Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment. Uh, what that is, is we have um, maybe like five, six editions. Mel, do you remember? Fifth one's coming up. Four editions in paper, paperback, and then the fifth one's coming up. And we actually have it as an online website with an emotional index. So suppose you're going through sadness or grief or jealousy or envy. You're going through emotional struggles and you can go to this website and basically it's, you basically have to sign up and then it has tools that are part of it. Instrument for Peace and, and uh, levels of mind and so on and so forth. But it actually has an emotional index where you go and you find your emotion of what you're struggling with, and it will recommend movies to help you pop through. So it's kind of a high-tech way of getting spiritual guidance to use movies to help pop you out of some of your major issues. It's fun. I mean, it's, it's starting to get gain in popularity. You know, most people think of meditation, and there's all these traditional ways to open up the spirit. <coughs> the Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment is, is gaining in popularity and growing more and more popular because it's very engaging. And, and that's, the movies are very engaging. This movie is very engaging. I don't know why it is at the end of this movie I always cry too. It's like I'm always seeing it for the first time and I'm, I'm like watching it and I'm waiting and watching and I'm like, ah, the waterworks come. It doesn't matter if I've seen it 15 times. Ah, psh, there it comes again. You know, it's like, it's, it's beautiful because we want the burst, right? We want the burst. We want to see the burst. We want to be inspired by the burst. That's what it's all about. You know, that's why when people watch a love story, they want, they want to see that. Even in fairy tales, people want happy endings, but, but we want to see it come about, and we love it when, when the, we can feel the spirit interjecting and interjecting. You know, these characters in this movie are, are pretty, pretty high-strung, um, pretty competitive, uh, their communication skills are not good. They, you know, they're, they're humans. They're like the rest of all of us, and they need help. They need a lot of help. And then comes Holy Man, coming in like a breath of fresh air, like a cool breeze on a hot day, just blowing in, and it's like, whoa! It just grabs your attention. And it's, Holy Man is uh, unorthodox. Uh, yeah, he's, he's, he's an out-of-pattern experience that shows up. And we've had people show up like that in our lives that are, that are out of pattern. They're like angels. He's like an angel that's been sent in. A very funny angel. And, and that's the best kind. You know, I've always loved stories uh, um, like way back, even in black and white, The Bishop's Wife. Has anybody ever seen The Bishop's Wife? Mm -hmm. Cary Grant. That goes back. Mm -hmm. Cary Grant plays an angel. Mm -hmm. David Niven is married, they have a child, their marriage, He's, he plays a, a priest, a stressed out priest who's all caught up into numbers and trying to raise a building fund and he's lost his ways. He's not serving Christ at all, he's just mired in ego stresses. He might as well be a CEO of, of some company that makes widgets or something because he's a priest but he's lost his way and then Cary Grant comes in and Cary Grant's an angel. And, and it's big time healing that happens when the angel shows up. And it's very funny. Cary Grant. This one is Eddie Murphy. Eddie Murphy is our, going to be our holy man. He's coming into the rescue uh, with all the spirit behind him and all the laughter and humor and everything that you can handle. Okay, we'll go. We may pause it a few times. It gets, but it's one of those movies that just gets better and better. And then boom, home run. JC Central delivers at the end. Grand Slam. Oh, <laughs> <laughs>
Flat tire, Holy Spirit at work. Now we start to see the Spirit come charging in to this very tight situation. Pressure, stress, anger, fast-paced, distractions, and now the tire blows. And everything is about to get flipped right side up from its upside down. <coughs> So he can't stand him, he wants this guy out of there as fast as possible, and she's just like, wow, he's kind and friendly and everything, and this is the, the motives that the Spirit has to come in. He has to come into the relationship, which is right now a working relationship with, with animosity, there's some competitiveness, there's all kinds of things that are typical in relationships on earth and G's coming in and she's just kind of open and he's just wanting bye 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 you know he's doing everything he can to get him out of the picture so then we'll see where it goes from here this is good <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wasn't that great? Oh, so sweet. <laughs> Holy man. Yeah. That's great when you have a, a movie that really takes you in to the point, to, you know, that you realize you can't, you can't compromise. I mean, I think that's what he had to do is he had to, he kept, he had a goal in mind and he, kept being tempted by that goal, but then in the end, he had to let go of the goal. And we have to do that. That's the only way beyond this world, is we have to let go of the goal. And, and really, what is the goal of the ego? We've talked about it in this retreat in different ways. We've said the goal, the wish that things be different than they are. And then we, we watched uh, The Butterfly Effect, which was such a dramatic movie and dramatic teaching that you really don't want things to be different in the world. You want to have a change of heart, a change of perspective. And I think in this movie we start to see that, that the profit motive that drives this world, uh, some of you might have seen The Truman Show, it was all based on product placement and it was all based on commerce. And this movie goes into extremes with the Home Shopping Network, the Good Shopping Network, the, the sell, 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 and products and so on and so forth. And then that, that profit motive, and then the, the motive of the spirit is basically not able to mix with that motive. In other words, the Holy Spirit wants to unwind your mind from guilt and wants to teach you that everything that you are and everything that you are created as is given as a free gift by the Creator. That free gift of our identity is what we're after. And all of this world is an attempt to compromise on that gift that gift of grace to say, well, there's something in this world that I want more than the grace of God, than, the, than my true identity. And that's the compromise that this world attempts to make. There's a beautiful section in The Course in Miracles called Beyond All Idols. And Jesus starts off that section by saying, what is an idol do you think you know? An idol is for more of something. It does not matter more of what. So this world is the projection of the idea of more. More anything, because it's denying what you are right now. And even the idea of self-improvement is part of the wheel of the ego. 
Even the things that seem to be the best things you could shoot for in this world are part of the defense against the realization of who you are right now. So I, I like this movie because it's, it really plays out that contrast and that compromise. You know, it's like he had his opportunities and, and part of him knew that if he sold his soul, as Kate was saying, I won't sell my soul. You know, when she went in to talk to the boss, I won't, won't sell my soul. It, part of him knew, you know, how he just became sad when he went for the contract, when he he gave in to that, yeah. that more, he just became so, so, so sad. And that's what we all discover. That's what this whole journey of seeming time and space is about, is to, to see that we don't need to compromise with that anymore. Practically speaking, how will that work? It, it is going to work with trust. You have to trust that the Spirit knows the way, the Spirit will provide for you everything that you need to unwind from this world. And that goes against this, this mechanism in the mind that is the survival mechanism, that is, I've got to do it on my own, and that is a, a belief that is highly valued in this world you know, to be able to provide for yourself as a person. Isn't that a highly valued belief? To autonomously be able to provide for yourself is revered. It's absolutely revered. And this is what Jesus and the Holy Spirit are up against. <laughs> Most everyone can see that they don't want to be dependent, they don't want to be at the mercy of the government, at, you know, and be on, you know, food stamps or some kind of government program. They don't want to be dependent on parents, they don't want to be dependent on things of this world, but, but it's highly self-sufficiency. Here's the, here's the book, you want to stand up and show that? We'll see if we can get that. That book is titled Self-Sufficiency. The Complete Book of Self-Sufficiency. That's how sneaky this place is, this cosmos, because we have books like that, that, that praise you for autonomy and self-sufficiency. And that's one of the most major lessons that you can learn, is that when Jesus says in A Course in Miracles, you need to learn to trust the Holy Spirit, he means you need to trust the Holy Spirit for everything. You, you still believe, he says, that you, you can run some aspects of your life and let the Spirit run some aspects. But that's that partial bargaining, like, oh, I can handle this, this, this. And a lot of times that's common in spirituality, where, where you say, okay, Spirit, Holy Spirit, you know, please handle this and this and this and this, and then you have to take an honest look at where you believe that you can do a better job than the Spirit. That's a, a critical, most important point. Sometimes I've talked to people who, who will say, well, I'm worried sick about my child, or I'm personally responsible for that child. And again, that's just another example of taking responsibility, as if you have more responsibility personally than the Holy Spirit. The flip side of that would be to say, I trust, I, I place this child in the hands of the Holy Spirit, or I give this child over to the Holy Spirit. I've had many instances over the years where I've worked with somebody who their child's you know, an adult child's thrown into jail or, or diagnosed with something and so forth, and they go crazy in, in, in a sense of being disturbed because they feel that they are personally responsible for the well-being of that child. Even the belief that you are personally responsible for the body that seems to be your own is still arrogant. 
You you only can be responsible for your state of mind. You only can be responsible for the accepting the correction. You only be, can be responsible for choosing divine innocence. That's the only thing actually that you can take responsibility for. And when you take that responsibility and you aim it at the body or the world or worldly conditions or anything like that, you are trying to take responsibility for something that actually, number one, doesn't exist, and number two, is over and gone. You're trying to take responsibility for something that's actually already gone. It's already the past. So, yes, get the microphone here. So in my corporate job, a job I had to do recently was come up with a plan to the end of June 2017. So I had to choose what I thought we should achieve all along the way to the end of June 2017 and then work back from that and work out, you know, how much time everything would take, blah, blah, blah. So then that leaves no room for the Holy Spirit to come in. So what do I do with that? Do I just, like, do it with a smile on my face and not worry about it and just go, yeah, here's your plan? Um, how do I work with that? Well, as I've said all along, the Holy Spirit and Jesus are very practical and the Holy Spirit's purpose is again to loosen you from the belief in time, from the belief in scarcity, lack, from the belief even in making plans, or from the belief in career and vocation. These are all concepts that it's like a tangled web, almost like a spider web that's been wound and wound and wound. And it can be, <coughs> spiders can do quite big, intricate webs, if you ever see, especially down here in Australia. <laughs> I've seen some of those spider webs there, and the spiders are big down here. <laughs> They've traveled around to other parts of the world, I can testify to that. And you have to be unwound from that. So to give you an example, I had a student back in the 1990s, and um, the more she studied the Course, and the more she worked with me directly, she started noticing that the goal of the Course, and the goal of her job and career, were at odds. So it was the first step. She was like, okay, the goal of A Course in Miracles, and the goal of my job, don't match. Just like in this movie, Ricky's goals, <laughs> sell, 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 you know, he was, you could see him all along, he was even with the grass mats, <laughs> when she was encouraging everybody to have a, a simple moment out in the grass. Uh, Robert Ricky raced, tearing through the storage room to find that mat that that guy introduced him to weeks months earlier. He had to find that map to make sale. And then when he, he said, it's, we've already sold out. He's like, already? But he had a satisfaction because there was a goal that he was pursuing that was opposite from G's goal. And he kept trying to bring G and the goal together. And we can try to bring goals of, of corporate, we'll say corporate Australia, or, or the corporate world and forgiveness and peace of mind, which is the goal of A Course in Miracles. And the sooner that we give in and realize that these two goals are not compatible, the better. Because Jesus says things like in the workbook, he says, everything you think, say, and do teaches all the universe. Everything. Everything you think, say, and do teaches all the universe. Every second we're either teaching the whole universe that we're the Christ or we're trying to teach the universe that we're something other than the Christ. And they both aren't true. You know, one's a lie and one is actually the fact of it. So, with my student from years ago, she came to me and she said, uh, I got a conflict because I'm doing a job, and what I'm doing 
in my job is clearly rooted in fear. She said, I have to be honest, the, the job that I'm doing is rooted in fear. And I said, well, tell me more about your job. And she said, well, I go to high schools and I go to different places around the community where I lived and uh, I talk about HIV prevention. I talk about um, birth control. Uh, I work for a health care provider and basically I'll stand up and I'll give a talk and every bit of my talk is based on fear. Fear of consequences, um, a, a protectionism, and I'm there to educate people, but, but everything that I speak, every time I deliver a talk, my hour-long slot is based on fear. And I feel like A Course in Miracles is telling me, you don't have to think like that, you don't have to live like that. There's another way. There's a better way. And, and I don't know what to do, because that's my job. So, she said, what would, what would you do? And I said, well, you, if you're paid, if you're hired by an employer to do a job, and you sign a contract, and you agree, to do a job, you're agreeing and signing to fulfill that. And G was even willing to do the G spot. He said, do you, is that what you want? You know, he always was saying, what do you want? So he wasn't invested in the outcome of the form of anything, but he, he was like saying, always offering Robert Ricky <laughs> the opportunity, what do you want? So with my friend, she said, well, what would you do? What how can I handle this? And I said, well, go back and do your job and, and go out there and give your talk, but I want you, when you get to the 50 minute mark of your talk, I want you to take a deep breath and pause. And I want you to take a moment to pray and I want you to speak completely from your heart for the last 10 minutes of your job when you go out there to talk and give it a try and see what happens. So she went out there for 50 minutes to do her job and say what she was hired to say, what she was educated to say, what she was told by her boss that she needed to say and then the last 10 minutes she just completely took a deep breath and spoke from her heart. I said, well how did it go? Because she started to do that every week. And she said, people started coming up to me. I said, what did they say? They said, wow, I really connected. What you were saying at the very end there was some of the most profound things that I have ever heard. And I wanted to ask you more about that. She spoke for 10 minutes from her heart. And people started coming up to her. And so this went on week after week where she started getting witnesses. She call, started immediately calling forth witnesses of the Spirit. Just from those last 10 minutes that she was speaking. Until she got to a point where down the line she basically was in there in her office and she started talking to her co-workers and she started to talk to her boss and she started to say things like I just can't do this anymore. This job isn't resonating with my heart. And she was bracing herself <laughs> for the impact and what she got was her co-workers and then even her boss said we know. We could feel it too. We know that it is time for you to move on to her next job. And, and it was a, a, another big step. The Spirit always orchestrates everything in time and space. 
as we are willing to not compromise in our purpose with our family, with our co-workers, with our employment, with everything in our dream world, then the Spirit takes care of it. And that's the same thing that everyone has to go through. I mentioned that uh, Jeff and Jeffrey had, had uh, told us about this movie, um, was it uh, Amongst the White Clouds? There were these uh, monks that had left their, their families, their lives, their busy lives to go live up in the mountains and live in hermitages, but basically the whole documentary is, is them talking about what's going on, their inner practice, the thoughts that they were facing, the fears that they were facing, the, the wants, the desires, the struggles, the challenges, you know, could see their stream of thoughts and also some of them were like, were like masters that were coming into deeper and deeper states of contentment, of bliss, of peace, through this inner practice of, of focusing on their mind. And really that's what any authentic spiritual pathway will do. It will have you take a much closer look at your consciousness, at your awareness, from the perspective of, I'm worth it, I'm worth peace of mind. I'm worth forgiveness. That's my whole purpose for this seeming lifetime, is to come inside. All the things that the world would check as advances and achievements that are so alluring, and they're so well reinforced. Oh, you've done so well. Corporate, okay, well, that's a, well, that's a promotion, and and you go. It goes on and on and on, and there's so many witnesses of reinforcing. Oh, you've done very well. And then we have a line from Jesus in the course where Jesus says, "You cannot judge your advances from your retreats. Your mind is so confused. You can't judge when you're advancing and when you're retreating." There's another part in the course where Jesus says, your mind is so confused that you cannot tell the difference between pain and joy. You cannot tell the difference between pain and joy. That's pretty deluded. And you may protest and you may say, Wait a minute, Jesus. I may be deluded, but I can tell the difference between pain and joy. But if you could tell the difference between pain and joy, you would never experience pain ever again. If you could tell the difference between pain and joy. There's, there's a confusion there. Remember, everything is a decision. <laughs> and who in their right mind would choose pain? No one. There must be some kind of trick going on. <laughs> if there's pain, there has to be a trick. It's not God's will. So you can see that's how deceived the mind is, of not being able to tell the difference between pain and joy. And that's where this movie is, is really good for that. It's, it's clearly showing the temptations of the world. even seemingly with an angry boss, even with the lures of, of success, of, of having money in his bank account, <laughs> and so on and so forth, he's faced with a decision. And I think his decision too was, he had that moment when his boss came on the set where he had to make a choice. And when the audience started to boo, he said, no, no, don't boo, don't boo. He needs 
needs a hug. He needs a hug and a kiss. <laughs> the Holy Spirit got a hold of him. <laughs> got a hold of his, his mind and just turned it in such a powerful way in that instant. And that even his boss just had to just kind of fade. <laughs> couldn't, couldn't contest what had just happened. There was no way, no need to contest it. So I think that's the thing, where we, we just have to, to have a crack of openness to have that prayer say, okay, here's where I seem to be in time and space. Here's my corporate job, here's my, here's my task. And just like Robert Ricky was praying in his closet, <laughs> you know, and in the end, G <laughs> had clearly heard his prayers, uh, that we, we need to pray. We need to play, pray for strength, you know, to, to guide us step by step, in a practical way. It's not saying, you know, we, have, we need to go ahead and try to take charge of the form. We just need to practice with our thoughts and, and pray that our, our thoughts be changed. Yeah. Thank you. And I might add that it works. It works. You won't be left out in the cold with this. This is, yeah. The Holy Spirit delivers. It's important. Yes, Pam. Uh, can you talk a bit more about that being self-sufficient? Uh, because the 12-step programs also talk about being autonomous, you know, like being self-sufficient. And that's what uh, I thought was a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, can you... S but that my mind is like flipped right now. I'm not. I thought it was. I was heading the right way, being self-sufficient and um, not codependent and all that. Yeah, I would say that that dependency, codependency, and autonomy are are actually different forms of the same error, the same lie. So, even though uh, autonomy is heavily reinforced as positive, and de dependency is heavily reinforced as negative. They're actually the same. And that's how sneaky the ego is. When I think of the 12-step program, because I know it very intimately, and I know many, many people over the years who, who have come through the 12 steps and gone through an immense healing, some who come into the Course of Miracles through the 12 steps. It's actually a a forerunner for their work with the Course, that the word autonomy, uh, which you're saying it seems to be reinforced by the program, actually the word that comes to mind when I think of the 12-step program is anonymous. Alcoholics, anonymous. It's not autonomous that the 12 steps are about. It's anonymous. They, they actually are taking you in to see the power of the higher power to help you when you call out and cry, my life, my addiction is unmanageable, absolutely unmanageable, and you cry out for another way. And it will take you into healing, which is synonymous with being anonymous. Mm, that rhymes. <laughs> the anonymity is what heals. In other words, you may seem to have a sponsor, and you may seem to follow the steps, and you may seem to do the work, but at some point there is a healing that occurs, and the only way that you stay sane and you stay healed in 12 steps is to give it away. You, you have to extend the gift. That's why people become sponsors when they 
they transcend the addiction. They actually are, are put immediately into a position of leadership. And, and they become sponsors. And they have sponsees. And it just keeps going and going and going. Much like in The Course in Miracles, there's students and teachers. And you're a student and then you keep practicing and practicing and practicing and as you become calmer and more still and more quiet and more tranquil, you, you are put into to a teaching role which really is to teach is to demonstrate. You just demonstrate peace. That's really what a teacher of God is. It's not so much about the words, but it is about your attitude in your mind. And if the words line up with the attitude, then that's good. If the words aren't in line with the attitude, then it won't be, you'll be the unhealed, unhealed healer. So, it's one of those things that that is so deeply ingrained in us to to be self-sufficient, like the, the book that we just saw, you know, on self-sufficiency. It's one of those that is a very sneaky trap. And um, I've often said, said things like, um, if the ego's last name was guilt, or if the ego's last name was sin, or if the ego's last name was fear, what's its middle name? And I say, autonomy. That's the ego's middle name. But it's hidden. It's very, very hidden, and it's so reinforced as being success. Now Jesus actually uses the word autonomy in A Course in Miracles, and he's saying, your real autonomy, so he puts real in front of it, R-E-A-L, your real autonomy is creation. Your spiritual gift from God. When, when God created you, God gave you everything. God gave you eternal life. God gave you true freedom. God gave you happiness. God's will for you is perfect happiness. Not just happiness, but perfect happiness. Those are all free gifts that God gave Christ in creation. And God gave Christ creative ability. So just like God creates in spirit, Christ creates in spirit. And if you read the Course, he's got this word creations. He's talking about Christ's creations, they're small c. And that's that's what he says is our real autonomy. But you see how different that is from personal autonomy. Personal autonomy is, I can do it on my own. Personal autonomy is, is a tremendous block to spiritual awakening. Uh, some of you know Kirsten, she wrote the book, uh, I Married a Mystic. And when Kirsten was, I think she told me this story, when she was like three years old, um, Jackie would come to try to help her put her shoes on, on little three-year-old Kirsten and tie her shoes. And Kirsten would jerk her feet away from her mother and say, me do. It was like, don't tie those strings. Me do. And then, uh, I think by the time she was 13, she was into Greenpeace, Save the Environment, Save Mother Earth, Save the Whales and everything as a, as a young teenager. And then by 15, left school. Just left school completely. And there was, a, she would say, a very strong autonomy that was, she noticed, from, from childhood, from young childhood up, there was a very strong autonomy. And it, in the years that I knew her, that was one of the things that, that reared its head up, that was one of her strongest blocks to peace of mind, was this sense of autonomy. I don't need anybody else. I can do it all on my own. Which, it leaves God out of the equation. And in the end, we have to learn to be so trusting with the Holy Spirit, with everything, every aspect of our life, 
that we include the Holy Spirit in, so much so that we follow the prayer in the Course, Holy Spirit decide for God for me, where you literally let go of all attempts to be in control, all attempts to run the show, all attempts to take charge and be in charge. Um, when I was growing up, there was always a saying that they told me, they said, look out for number one. And I said, who is number one? And they said, you. And I said, who? They said, you look out for number one, look out for your personality self. Always watch your back and always look out for number one. And um, then I was exposed to many things. There was a there was a football player, an American football player, who was very famous, called Gail Sayers. And uh, he wrote a book, which got turned into uh, a movie that I saw when I was much younger. And the name of the movie, and the name of the book was, I Am Third. And I was like, well, that's fascinating, I Am Third. I had to read, what is he talking about, I Am Third? God is first, my family is second, and I am third. You see how the personality self is subjugated behind God and family in that one. So with A Course in Miracles, what Jesus is saying is, is you have to take your personality self and the world and the construct of the personality self and you have to surrender that back including that tiny mad idea and everything that came from that tiny mad idea, you have to give it back to God. Don't try to hold it apart, but, but surrender it back to God and it will disappear. But if you, if you protect it, if you value it and protect it, that's hell. And if you surrender it back and you give it back, then that's what salvation is, that's what spiritual awakening is, of knowing your true self. There's even a workbook lesson in The Course in Miracles, and it's the great title of a lesson. It says, I choose the second place to gain the first. Isn't that a fascinating title? Among all the great ideas in A Course in Miracles, I am as God created me, I am not a body, I am free, I am still as God created me, I am spirit, I am the Holy Son of God Himself, you know, it, there's, there is nothing to fear, you know, there's so many, 365 lessons. That's one of the lessons, that's actually one of Jesus' lessons. I choose the second place to gain the first. That the ego is the belief that you can play God. And what does it even mean to play God? But it means that you can be the creator of yourself. You can actually create yourself. And autonomy is tied into that, I can create myself any way I want to be, I can handle everything personally, and, and it's actually, the belief is it's actually good to be that competent that you can handle everything or anything personally. And what seems to be the, the greatest thing that's valued in this world is actually like a steel bar Binding the mind, keeping the mind from the truth. So that's, that's very humbling to realize that. But as soon as you start to realize that, you will never look at anything of this world the same. You'll say, I give this career to you, Jesus. I, I give this, this pursuit. I give this ambition. Ambition, we, most of us were raised that ambition was a good thing. I was raised certainly that way. I was raised in a Protestant, Christian Protestant denomination that valued the Protestant work ethic, was what it was called. Work, work, work. Self-sufficiency, raise yourself up, achieve, accumulate, possess, retire with a nice big nest egg, enjoy all the good things of the world with your nest egg, the Bible says, eat, drink, and be merry, for one day we shall die. <laughs> and 
the, the way that you're supposed to do it is, yeah, but die with a big nest egg. Because then you can pass it on to the future generations. Oh, more, more kudos. You pass on your inheritance. You see, it's a system that's designed with every aspect of it to keep you from becoming still. Be still and know that I'm God. To keep you from forgiving, to keep you from going into the silence. The whole thing. And it doesn't matter how many people reflect that belief system, you have to start to see it's, it's, the, it's the lie. That's the lie underneath everything. So it's pretty huge when you really look at it. All these conspiracy theorists, the ego is the conspiracy. It's a death wish and it's an, an imposter identity that was made to take the place of the truth of the eternal spirit. Thanks for bringing that up. That's it's very well hidden. Yes. And it's everywhere. There's plenty of evidence for that one, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, what's fun about my travels around the world is getting to go to over 40 countries and getting to meet all these people and the different cultures and all this and this. And I'd have to say that in general the happiest people that I meet on a, on a mess, on a group scale are the ones that have no interest in material accumulation, material possession, or in time. The happiest people I meet are, they have no interest in time. Uh, that's why one of our centers is down in Mexico. Uh, when you take something to get it fixed, or you take something in to have something served, or whatever, they'll say, manana, manana. Yeah. And manana, I've learned, means, despite what the dictionary or people will tell me, manana means not now. <laughs> and they have a smile on their face and you know they're laughing on the inside when they go, manana, manana, because they could care less. It'll get done when it gets done. I'm not going to rush, there's no pressure, there's no stress. I'm happy and I'm staying happy. And it'll get done whenever it gets done. That's what manana, manana means. And also, uh, what I love about the, this place we have down in Mexico is that when you start to approach it, you know, you go to it. When I first went to it, I think I was with my friend Suzanne and um, Francis, we were in the car, and Suzanne was going, this looks like India. Uh, I said, what do you mean India? She said, I mean one of the slums in India. And I said, well, we're going to see the house. And as we get down the street, you know, it's, it's like in one of the, it, it looks like the, like the slums. And yet, you look around at the people and you see happy, smiling faces, children running and gleefully playing in the streets. And materially, if you were looking at it, it doesn't look like much. And yet, the dogs seem happy, the cats seem happy, the people seem happy. Everybody's wearing a smile on their face. And when you take the time to actually be with them and everything, you see they have actually no interest in time at all. They're not interested in commerce, they're not interested in making a better life. There's a huge contentment. And I would say very much like some of the Aborigines down here, in Australia, they are in a, in a much more evolved <laughs> state of mind than those that are so concerned. That's why I always like singing that Barbara Streisand song from Funny Girl. You know, the best things in life are free. 
And that's the truth. The, the, our, our very nature, our very God-given life is free. It's a free gift. It doesn't have a cost. It can't be owned. It can't be possessed. It's not bound by time. You know, all those qualities. It's because it's free. It's a free gift. Spirit is free. We even put the words together. Free spirit. <laughs> That's a compliment. For some. <laughs> Others will say, hmm. Yeah, she's a free spirit. Because <laughs> yeah, the ego does not like those qualities. Yeah. Yes. The this the world was over the minute we made the decision because it was corrected and we are reliving like for the second time sort of thing. And the and you know in the Gary Renard in his book he talks about meeting his future life, a future self or whatever you call it. And they they say you will be born like me and we have already become enlightened. So you will become enlightened in your next life and in Chicago where he was born in a totally different kind of United States. Uh, and he's born there and he becomes enlightened there. And they say we already got enlightened. So you know it kind of ties in with the holographic nature of the of the whole thing, you know, whole universe. And I have this image like, you know, um, everyone maybe together, like a child in the mother's arm, and the mother is the God, and then maybe we were awake before, but we fall asleep in the lap of God and start dreaming, like parallel dreams, multiple dreams, and uh, and we have we are kind of a part of this fragmentation, dreaming different different dreams, and uh, and we can choose which like go to past or future or which stream that we want to take in any lifetime, because it's all simultaneous. And uh, when I saw that Gary was saying that. It's kind of affirming that kind of a holographic thing is happening, and Jesus, it already happened, and you are reliving it. Can you speak to that, what, that whole thing, and that concept, really? Yeah, well, in the end, it's like you just start to look directly at the concepts, but the idea of, even of life and time, that as well known as that is with reincarnation and, and so on and so forth, that's, that's a contradiction in terms. Right. Life and time. Because there is ultimately no such thing as life and time. It's, it's seeing the past as the past is what frees the mind from this idea of lifetimes. Past lifetimes, future lifetimes. It's like with the Akashic Records, you know, or psychics, a lot of times people marvel that psychics can tell the future, or Akashic Record readers can, can read you in, in great detail the future, which seems to be a marvel, like, ooh, 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 I can, I can know the future in, in great specifics. But what is the future but the past? Uh, what I've done is, over the years, I've used concepts in teaching this with the students, like I would say, there's the past past, and the future, and the future past. past. Right. And, and it just, as if they're different. Yes. But, in one sense you could say it's, it seems holographic, but holographic is still that uh, the whole is in every part. And actually what Jesus has told me is, the whole is real. And the parts are not. 
there there aren't any holes inside the parts. W H O L E. It's it's the, the the concept of parts is just part of the. It's the, again that's the construct. It's just the construct. So. Um, Again, I think it comes back to the practice. For me, it was always, I kept hearing Jesus saying over and over, freely you have received, now freely give. Like, get into the joy of giving, the joy of extending. Let me speak through you, let me smile through you, let me laugh through you, let me hug through you. Get into the joy of that giving vibe, and then everything, you might say, is seen as whole. Everything feels whole. There's no... There are no parts, but there's really no way to mm -hmm. to understand. You might think of all that as future lives as just like stepping stones. Yeah, I was. You know, it seems like there's no future. Like everything has happened already. That's why it's there. So we kind of dreaming from future to past to whatever. It's it. it I heard that you can even go to past and and dream a past life in your future, so called future. So it's all kind of available at any time. It's like we are choosing which uh, one we like. It's all still a dream, but still our future can be a past um, as well. And I was wondering what he says, you are really living second time. It's as though all these possibilities were there, we lived it in our dreams. And it's all corrected, but we, we don't want to accept it. We're kind of reliving or going through some of that stuff again. Well, I don't know why he said second time. We are reliving what was corrected. Is he talking about this present moment, like every moment we are stepping out of it, every time we step out of the present moment, we are reliving it? Or, but I was wondering what he meant by second time, we are reliving it second time. Yeah, it's the way to get past the complexity is come back to the simplicity, like the, the line from Jesus, the past is gone, the future is but imagined, these concerns are but defenses. Okay. How many of us were raised in psychology and we learned about Freud and defense mechanisms? Projection, denial, sublimation, there's just all kinds of defense mechanisms. But what did Jesus just say? The past is gone, the future is but imagined. These concerns are but defenses. Whoa, never read that in the psychology book. The future is a defense. The past is a defense. You see the leap from these psychological things. Even words like projection, oh, she's projecting onto her husband, oh, he's projecting onto his wife. As if bodies can project, as if persons can project, when what? Persons are <laughs> projections. <laughs> persons don't project. You hear the modern language and you go to a psychotherapist, oh. You're just projecting onto your partner, onto your spouse. Oh no. The entire cosmos is an attempt to get rid of guilt and see it as if it's external. To let, to, to let it go by seeing it as if it's elsewhere. Well, the past is a defense and so is the future. So, ultimately, you know, we talked earlier today about going in and really going for the moment. That's, that's another way that you go for it. You start to see that all the thoughts about the future and all the thoughts about the past are defending against the holy instant. So then, that's, that's making things simpler. We've eliminated future lifetimes and past lifetimes. Those are distractions. And then you get down to, okay, then how do I experience the holy instant? How do I experience the power of now, that Eckhart talks about. And he says, it's by desiring it. Remember that labyrinth that's outside? You've got to get out from the outer rings down back to the center. 
It's a beautiful symbol. Go, go to the center, go to the core. Yeah. In my defenselessness, my safety lies. Now, is that uh, the now of in defenselessness is is the instant? Mm-hmm. That's it. Right. At no single instant does the body exist at all. In no single instant is there a problem. But if I anticipate the future or pull, pull the past forward, you know, then that's, that's it. And, and then it comes down to that Jesus has to teach new time ideas, like he talks about that in the beginning of the workbook. He says, he says in the workbook, at the, the beginning of the workbook, we need to introduce new time ideas. Isn't that a fascinating to say, thing to say? We need to introduce new time ideas. And part of his new time ideas, as you go into it more and more, is that he is teaching that, that the present moment is not between the past and the future. Not. <coughs> that, that present is an invention of the ego. So the ego invented linear time completely. The, the spirit has nothing to do with time. Jesus would even show, uh, show Helen Schuckman in her mind, he would take her down, you know, we tend to think uh, from our education in this world, it's like the timeline, but he said, no, time, he showed Helen a glimpse of time as a spiral, not a line. It's a, it's a, it's a line, but it's, it spins like a spiral. And then he took Helen in, his, in, in the mind and he said, now if you come with me, and he showed the spiral from different angles, and if you come close enough to the spiral, it seems to be um, continuous. But if you get back, you can start to see different segments of the spiral, which is, which is seeing it from a, a different perspective. So basically, in the end, it's, we need a new interpretation of time. We need to see time differently. And that's what happens, is we keep working with the Course. You know how they say, time flies when you're having fun, or I had so much fun that I lost track of time. Isn't that amazing that you can have so much fun that you actually lose track of the passage of time? We have had those experiences. You know, this is, isn't new to us. We go, oh yeah, that happens. And so really, that's the whole point of what seems to be our mind training. What we're doing is, is to have a new perception of time, a healed perception of time. And now we even have movies coming out, like uh, Mr. Nobody, if, if you want to watch a real quantum movie, uh, watch something like Mr. Nobody, because that's, that's, that is messing with time. <laughs> that is really messing with time. Uh, there's movies like Memento, there's a number of movies that, that actually have come out that, that Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, that's messing. I, I had to laugh. The first time I went to see Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, I went there and I was just ooing and aahing in the movie theater. But when I got up to leave, there was an elderly gentleman, maybe 80 years old, and I could he hear him cursing and muttering something under his breath. And I went closer to him and he, he was like, that's the worst, worst movie. I have ever seen in my entire lifetime. And it just broke the perception, his perception of time in that movie. You know, time, you, you, it's supposed to progress forward and it's supposed to have segments that follow along and that eternal sunshine of the spotless mind with Kate Winslet and Jim Carrey, it, it broke it broke his assumptions, and then he, he called it the worst movie he'd ever seen in his entire life. But I was like in a state of glory, because I was like, ooh, this, this is messing with 
<laughs> with linear time. And that's exactly what Jesus wants us to do, is mess, mess with the ego's construct, and loosen from it, and keep loosening from it. Yeah. Yeah, if you're curious about this, I think I can highly recommend coming along on the Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment and come along on a journey with me and I will, I will take you on quite a journey with some of these movies. Solaris. Come, come into the mind with Solaris or there's, there's just lots of movies that you can go on a journey In this world, people tell me that sometimes they have drug experiences or meditation experiences, but a lot of people have mystical experiences with me in the movies. Some people use ayahuasca, some people use movies with David. <laughs> and, and we will actually go into some movies and it's trippy. It gets trippier and trippier just from the commentary in the movies <laughs> together. Some people feel like they've taken a hit of something. <laughs> but really it's just, it's the mind's willingness to see things differently in the commentary and the parables. You know, that's what Jesus did back then, he just kept using parables. And, and keep using parables over and over to, to like say, here I'll peel back the limits of your mind and you'll see a whole new world, a new fan fantastic point of view, just by peeling back the, those assumptions. So, we probably have one movie night left. <laughs> but it's been great. It's been great. And thank goodness for comedy. That's the kind of holy man we want. We want somebody that, where we're laughing, laughing along the way. That makes it lighter, going back with humor. Yeah. I feel so grateful for the humor. Okay, that's our show for tonight. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you. That was, yeah. Sweet. Yeah. 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 Yeah.